There's a book I'm reading right now. It's called Getting to Neutral. And it's really pushing my thinking because I, I really try to focus on being positive and thinking about how do we move forward. And when I think of positive leadership, it's how do we influence people to move forward in a positive direction? And so this idea of getting to neutral is kind of interesting because it's really not focused on the negative aspect, but really what do we need to do in any given situation? And I want to read a quote from this book. It says this, the next time your world feels like it's collapsing around you, grab your mental gear shift and ask yourself something similar. Don't worry about the big picture. Ask this, what is the next thing I need to do? So articulating what is going on right now, what do I need to do to actually move forward and, and really kind of help through this situation? I remember when COVID first happened and, you know, like the rest of the world, March, 2020, everybody's world changed. And I was really fr terrified because I've been speaking, traveling, and all of a sudden that, and you know, that's ending and watching all my events being canceled and thinking like, what am I going to do now? And so I was upset for a day. And then the next day I started thinking, okay, this is the reality what I need to do. And I figured out some solutions. I figured out some things that I was going to do moving forward. And that really helped me is that what is a situation? What is the next right thing to do? And this is why I really uh, enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Donia Ball. Uh, she's a superintendent in California. And she actually wrote a book called Adjusting uh, the Sales, which is really talking about how do we create, you know, how do we actually when we're dealing with uh, issues in leadership, but how we're dealing with, you know, bad times uh, in education, what is the next right thing to do? So I really appreciate the conversation. Um, Donia, like myself, is uh, the child of immigrants. And really, I, I, I really thank my parents for putting this mindset into me, understanding there's opportunity, uh, even an obstacle. And I could see that in the way Donia talks about her father. And I thought that was really powerful part of the conversation. So I'm so appreciative that you're here today. I know you're going to learn a lot from Donia, just like I did uh, from this conversation. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Carlos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Today, I'm blessed to have Dr. Donia Ball, who is a superintendent in in Central California. Is that would that be fair to say, Central California? Absolutely. Right? And so I've been out there to. Uh, is it? I know you are in the area of Visalia at the Academy's CMO. There's a bunch of other stuff. So it's just you're like kind of gave me some help. Brief, too. brief. Yep. Uh, so I know you're superintendent there, uh, and and Donia actually has a book out called Adjusting the Sales. This is the first in the series of three, and the other two are coming out later. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about that book. But Donia, if you could just actually introduce yourself to everybody, tell us what you do today um, and how you got there. That's a, a great place to start. Yeah, so Donya Ball or Donya. Yeah, like Don, George, Don, Don, I asked you and then you just said it wrong. You told well, me Donya and then you went Donya. Listen, it, this is what's really what, interesting. And how many really. how many students do this as well, right? <laughs> it's like it's like we just so get so used to what people call us that we start calling ourselves the same thing as well. But yes, all right. Birth all name right. is Listen, Donia. Every time I have a po <laughs> every time I have a podcast, it could say, your name could be Jim. I'm like, is it pronounced Jim? No, it's Jim. Okay. Well then here we go. So like, I want to make sure. So I always ask and then you made me look bad there. No, so no, 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 it's no, no, Donia no. It and, is Donia. And, Absolutely. And Donia. Absolutely. And as you said, I'm currently a superintendent of phenomenal charter schools in Visalia, the Academy's charter schools, TK through eighth grade. And, you know, um, just like a lot of other leaders, I really started out as teacher and progressed through hmm. the administrative roles. And what's really interesting is that this current role that I'm in right now it was not something that I even saw on the horizon. I think like a lot of leaders, sometimes doors close yeah. for certain opportunities. And sometimes actually, and in, even in my case, there's heartbreak when doors close. Yeah. And at the time you look at it like, oh, goodness gracious, I didn't see that coming. And yet then it can be lead to beautiful destinations, which is really what I'm experiencing now in this role as superintendent. 
I love that. And th that's something that I've really learned. And we were talking before the podcast because you are close to uh, Fresno. Yes. And I actually was uh, on track to become a basketball coach. I love basketball. I'm wearing my Orlando Magic stuff right now. I tend to wear basketball stuff every single day. And uh, I was super bummed that I didn't get it, even though I, it looked like I was going to get that job. And this is, you know, my second or third year. Mm -hmm. And you think that's kind of the end of the world, but I so appreciate the work that I'm doing today and where I've gone. And I think a lot of times when those doors close for us, and it sounds really cliche, you, you do have to find those, those, those other uh, doors that open. How did that, you know, when you, when you say that, like kind of what's the backstory? Like, how did you, wh how do you, why do you see the world that way? Like what, what door closed for you that has led you to where you, what you're doing today? Yeah. Well, I think, I think first off, it came down to before I even experienced rejection or being passed up, right? Hmm. My my dad, who was born in Iran during a very different time, mm -hmm. came to the States and he really had that mindset and I think instilled that in my brother and I about overcoming obstacles, right? And some yeah. people, I think, just have that drive where no matter how big the mountain is, we're going to figure out a way, whether it's around oh. or over, right? We're going to figure out a way. And so I think a lot of it had to do with just that, that mindset growing up from my father. But regarding like the specific situation, and actually, this, this actually inspired much of writing the first book, Adjusting the Sales, mm -hmm. was experiencing the heartbreak of being passed up. And I was kind of, it was a trajectory. I was in a smaller, smallish district and I was assistant superintendent for five years. And it was like, I was next in line for that superintendent position. Mm -hmm. um, I had solid relationships, right? With staff, community, um, with um, the board. And it was nothing short, but shocking. When I applied, I went for it. And, you know, it's a small community. Everybody knows everybody. There was a lot of embarrassment, you know, and just kind of humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, there was some political, um, of course, when decisions are made like this, right? right. Some political and, um, you know, backlash, community revolt. And I, at the time, thought to myself, okay, I have two choices here. Number one. I can stay and I can like be victim to a district that says we don't want you, but still stay. Right. Or I can pick myself off the ground because during those first few days, George, as I'm sure that you and I know certainly other leaders have experienced, you're in like this deep, dark place of my world's been turned upside down. And I don't even know really what my purpose is because I thought my purpose was being here. Right. And now that I'm being told it's not, I got to kind of redefine things in yep. my own mind. And so that's where I was like, okay, I, I did the grieving. I did the crying. I did the, you know, the behind the scenes, just outright pissed off piece. And then once I got to that point of, I can't stay, but I don't know where, Mm -hmm. It was like the opportunities just kept coming. Right. And I picked where I'm currently at, the charter schools, and it has been absolutely phenomenal. But I wouldn't have even had the opportunity to write, to speak, right. to do these other things if I would have been in that role of superintendent in that district. It just wouldn't have happened. It's amazing. You know, I have a very good friend. And if that friend is listening right now, text me that you're listening because that went through exactly the same thing that you're talking about. And they were by far the best person for the position. And it was like the politics and not focused on what is best for the school dis district, what's not best for the teachers, but you know, what makes the the board look really good or, you know, or, you know, there may be fear of some, you know, that happens and it's unfortunate. And I think that sometimes it's, it's a sign that you, it, it, Hey, it's time to go and serve another place. Like when, when educators say this to me, like, Oh, it's really hard to leave these kids, you know, like I've invested so much in them. I'm like, but there are other kids who need support as well. 
right? 100%. Like it's not, it's, yep. you're, and within a week, I promise you, you'll be like, wow, I can never leave these kids, right? And that's how we feel because we there's an emotional connection to our communities and things like this. But I learned that I, I don't stay in places where, you know, I think this is a really important aspect. I've been talking a lot about this over the last couple of years. Specifically, there is a difference between the idea of being valued and feeling valued. And if uh, leaders don't actually make that connection between the importance that people feel valued, mm-hmm. you can say all you want. Mm-hmm. But when you you develop them, and I, I can't remember the book, uh, but I read it, said you should never hire someone externally to a leadership position uh, unless they are 30% better. Now, how you measure that than anybody else, because there's all those things you have to teach them about the culture, about the community and things like that too, that if they're not like head and, you know, shoulders above, way better than anybody else, then, then it doesn't really make sense to do that. Yeah. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. And I know uh, specifically people that I've connected with that have felt passed over and not for the right reasons, right? Right. And I've seen that too. Well, and what's super problematic about this entire topic is that we just don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. It it there because of the shame and because of the, um, you know, the shock factor or whatever. That but this is what's super interesting is that after the book came out and I devoted a chapter just to this topic of being passed up because this is yep. one of the storms that. Every leader, and if they haven't experienced yet, they should start preparing themselves mindset mm-hmm. mentally that this absolutely could happen within their career. But all of a sudden, the stories start flooding in. Oh, I'm so glad you wrote about yeah. this and you're talking about it. But if only we were to share the ugly pieces, right, of yeah. what really happens when you're in these types of situations, when you experience this heartbreak, because it tenfold helps. I mean, we have so many people listening to this now that it's springtime. They don't know where they're going to be next year. They're looking for the next thing because they were either passed up. They were terminated. They didn't see it coming. The rugs been pulled out underneath them. And unfortunately, they just don't have people to talk to about it because in the close circles, it's like everyone's in the roles they want to be in. Yeah. And I I think that um, as harsh as this might sound, the importance of having loyalty to yourself and your family overrides to a district or right. a school. 100%. Because at the end of the day, um, they, they make their decisions and you have to make your decisions. What brings you happiness, uh, what brings you purpose, where you feel valued that really, really matters. And the one thing I, I am not okay with is you hating where you're being and staying there and complaining. Yes. Just go. Like it's just go. And I think that's, yeah. you know, I, I when I, I think you and I have a similarity in story because um, you talk about your your father being a, a, an immigrant from uh, Iran. My parents were immigrants from Greece and very, yeah. probably very different time frame. And sometimes when I hear people complain about stuff, I'm like, you have no idea like what my family went through. Yes. And when I say my family, I'm not talking me, I'm talking about my mom and dad. Totally. And how grateful they are for the opportunities that they were provided, you know, coming over to North America compared to where they had, and they had a mentality, um, to seek out opportunities to, you know, kind of put themselves in a situation where they could really, really grow and get better. And they didn't, they came here with nothing, like literally exactly. had $20 in his pocket. So when you, when you look at that and you look at your family, how is that really kind of, supported you, you know, not only in your superintendent career, your leadership career, writing books, but, you know, just maybe your overall thinking, how, how does that, you know, that family situation really helped you? Yeah. Well, you know, my dad and, and actually that entire family, because they, they really fleed a country that was going through some major turmoil and was in transition. They couldn't stay and feel like they were safe. So that in itself was a very unique situation. But once here, and like you were saying, like your parents putting in the insane amount of work Mm -hmm. to become successful, to provide for the family, it, it instilled the mindset for me that it does not come easy. 
nothing comes easy. And unfortunately, we, you know, all, I'll be, and it, this is what probably something that is most irritating to me when I talk to people is they want to cut corners. They want to get from plant to, from A to B, but they want to do it in a way where it waters things down or it's easier. Mm-hmm. And that I think because of my dad's mindset of it, you got to grind you got to put in the time Mm -hmm. in order to get from point A to point B. And we want it to be stellar. This plan, this implementation, we want it to be amazing and cutting corners and, you know, taking now being smart and strategic and saving Mm -hmm. time. That's one thing. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that they just want to make it easy for themselves to make the easy money or just to rush through it to be done, to check off the list. And I think that that was really what my dad's mindset was. I was a competitive swimmer growing up and that took hours and I went to college and swam. So it took that, that it was that mindset of if I'm going to improve my time, if I'm going to get to my personal best, I know you said you run, there is a lot of training. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of goal setting. There's a lot of um, feedback, right, that you get from a coach or others to say, you got to tweak this, you got to tweak that. And there's adjustments that are made along the way in order to be the best that you can at whatever that is. And I think that mindset that my dad really instilled on me, both my parents actually, um, when I was younger, I really have transferred over into that leadership realm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's funny because I, um, I, I, te- I typically schedule these podcasts so I can always have some time to work out in the morning. Yeah. And I've worked my butt off and now my pace is, was once what my sprint was right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that. And, and I appreciate that. There's a quote from Jim Valvano's father, uh, Jim Valvano. He, if you know, he, um, he passed away of cancer, uh, he was the first award for the ESPY awards. It's one of my favorite speeches of all time. It's, and he said something in a different speech that I'll never forget. He said, his dad told him that, um, hard work does not guarantee success, but lack of hard work guarantees no success. Yes. And, and that, that, that is one of my favorite quotes I love of it. all time. And people get mm-hmm. mad at it and I'm like, doesn't make it any less true. Like, as a, you can get bothered by it, but it is, mm-hmm. you know, it is a reality. There, there is so much opportunity here and um, it, it really has instilled in me. Now, let's let's talk about your book, Adjusting the Sales. Now, you told me a little bit about it on our last podcast, uh, yeah. but you talked about kind of some of the big problems that happen in, in administration and leadership and how to deal with them. And, you know, I, we were, I was joking around that you probably pre- predicted, you know, you didn't predict the pandemic, but to some aspect, there's, there's like, there's still kind of a, a, a theme that was there that would have helped people through that as well. So tell us a little bit about the book and, you know, kind of what, what the, the, the hope of that, of that book is in the first place to help leadership. Yeah. So, you know, before I actually set out to write the book, I, as I was like living the experiences of a site leader as a system principal, as a principal, right. I was, I feel like I was doing a really good job at the time of not necessarily like formally documenting, but remembering like all of these crazy storms that were happening year after year. And you know, everyone says like leadership is lonely at the top, whatnot. But as I started kind of going from year after year in leadership, I thought, you know what, what I want to do is I want to write a series that is entirely relatable to anyone in any leadership position, because these are the most critical storms that every leader is going to encounter at some point in their career. So the the first book, Adjusting the Sales, for example, starts out right off the bat. Chapter one is called Adjusting to Your Unpopular Position, Hmm. right? So you make the transition from teacher to leader, and you're used to being adored, liked by students, by parents, right? And all of a sudden, bam, right out of the gate, 
you're now hated. Um, You've hate, changed. Hate. You've <laughs> changed. <laughs> You've changed. You went to Look the dark, the dark side. side. <laughs> yeah. It actually, the name of the chapter is Haters Gonna Hate. <laughs> Adjusting to your unpopular position, right? And so, but there's, but nothing really prepares you for that, right? right. It's like, right. you just have to go with your gut and you're like, okay, I'll talk to some people about this. But it is extremely stressful and dramatic, all of these situations. And so that was really the inspiration for writing it. The books, the book is written in third person. And I did that strategically. And that is because it's not just my stories, but it's accumulation of many leaders right. stories. And it's connecting to the human heart of all leaders where it's like, this is like, they're in the story themselves. So it reads as if they're dealing with hmm. this, this problem. Right. I mean, as much as I'd like to say, people want to just hear about Donya's leadership, um, Donya. you know, challenges, Donya. Donya. I, Donya's, Donya's leadership challenges. It's, it's more of, of, I want leaders to feel like they are in it. And that's really what the feedback has is that it, 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 that's kind of the art and craft of writing is making sure that there's that you're connecting right to, to the leaders and to the readers. And so it's been super fun to be able to kind of take this risk. So, so this is, uh, this is airing. We were recording this in April. It's probably around May or June when this is, um, you know, people are listening to this right now. Yeah. And I guarantee you, some people are making the transition uh, yes. to to an admin position, to a coaching position. Uh, to be honest, with you probably a bunch of people are saying, "I'm out. I'm out of education." <laughs> totally. right? Exactly. There has been mass exodus, and, that's okay. and I'm yep. I'm I'm like, listen, if you're not happy, that, that tells people something. And I think if there's yeah. a mass exodus, I actually don't think it's the worst thing because no. When people don't, when say like, when a bunch of people say like, we're not putting up with this anymore, yeah, then people have to like, okay, well, we got to create an organization that people want to be a part yeah. of. So I think that, that, so what advice would you give to someone making a transition to a, a leadership position or a new position as they, you know, first enter it? So, you know, we talked about this a little bit before, you know, we hit record and that is that in leadership, without a doubt, you are going to be involved with highly, highly um, stressful and I would say controversial issues, right? Mm. Where, but the community that you're serving, the staff that you're serving, they're looking at you for steadfast consistency. And so my number one advice is that you are going to need to have the cojones. And I hope I'm allowed to say that on here. And I use that word in my book in chapter one, to be able to stand up for what's right, even if it's an unpopular decision. Right. And so how many times have we as leaders been in this where we're like, okay, I could go along with this, but I know that the end result is going to actually be a disaster, or I can really communicate this in a way that makes sense to the people that I'm serving. It's not necessarily going to be the most popular message, right. but at the end of the day, I know long-term it's going to be what's right for kids what's right for staff and whatnot. And so being able to stand your ground and make mm -hmm. those tough calls and not conform to the popular um, pressure mm -hmm. is going to serve every leader well. Well, and as, so, and I, I think we got to kind of make a distinction here in the sense that when sometimes when we say the popular decision, it actually is the most popular but the loudest minority pretends that it isn't. And then uh -huh, yes. people are so terrified of that. And, you know, when I remember having a really tough conversation with a staff member and my assistant principal was in that room and the staff member left and I was just like, just started eating my lunch. And she's like, how are you okay? I said, because my focus is to ensure that we are doing what's best for our kids. Mm -hmm. And so 
because I kept that in mind, I'll be, I'll be able to sleep. No problem tonight. Like I'll be fine. Yes. Once I start getting my ego in the way and it's about me being right and me looking good, that's when I start to lose sleep. And I think it's, it's actually the weird thing. It's about putting your ego aside, doing what's right. And more times than not doing what's right will actually be the popular opinion, whether that's stated or not. Cause I think yes. a lot of people, and sometimes people need just to stand up to the loud, obnoxious people that don't necessarily aren't doing the right thing, but it is their ego getting in the way. Right. And they want to make sure that because they, they feel they can kind of, you know, like there's, there's a lot of bullies out there that don't, they don't act like they're bullies cause they just pretend they're right, but they're mm -hmm. still bullies in some ways. And so I think that's a really important aspect. So I, 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 I love that advice. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking about move transitioning into a new position. What's some advice you give to people, you know, going into summer, right. And going into uh, a little break, right. Not worrying about the work, but just for themselves. What, what's some advice you'd give them? You know, stay true to the things that you love. And so a lot of people think of summer as like, okay, now this is, you know, break time, no work time. And we just know that that's not the case. So um, when, when summer hits, actually most of the work is getting done for mm -hmm. your, you're reflecting on what worked, what didn't work for, from the past year. And now you're planning for the current year. So summer is one of those interesting times that, a lot of the perception is, is like, oh, we're just off. But actually that's when the majority of the behind the scenes work has to take place mm -hmm. is during that time. And so being able though, to gift yourself those days of being able to have that self-care, that thing is like, for example, where my, my daughter's graduating from high school this year. Thank God she needs to graduate and, and do her thing. You know, there's some kids, George, I don't know. You're, yeah. I think yours are younger. Right, where it's yeah. like, it, and, and I've told her this, where, where you cry and you're depressed when they leave. I think that leaving is going to be a good thing for her. She needs, <laughs> she needs, she, I'm ready. She's ready. Yeah, but, yeah. but we're going to, you know, take a family vacation this year and which we don't always get. Yeah. And I am so looking forward to having that disconnect time because I'm probably disconnect maybe 10 days out mm -hmm. of the year. Right. And so having that summertime to truly disconnect, to still feel like you're insanely productive behind the scenes. I love that feeling of uh, we have accomplished so much and we're reflecting from what worked, what didn't work. And we're planning for, to, you know, for improvement for next year. But at the same time, I have like this awesome time to just totally decompress with family, with friends. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the perfect summer. And I hope that more leaders, more, more people are able to have that type of summer. Right. And it's kind of like, you know, professional athletes, right? They, if you constantly just push yourself, you will get injured. You'll have, and it's, you know, just, physically, but the thing with educators that they can be mentally and emotionally, yes. right? Maybe they, maybe they don't have a broken leg from working too hard, but then they have a, a breakdown, right? And that, that can happen. So I love that. So Donia, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Awesome. Everyone that's listening, I know the book adjusting the sales is going to be really helpful. And I think um, a lot of leaders, a lot of educators are dealing with a lot of adversity and kind of having mm -hmm. those solutions, you know, kind of, and I don't think you say like, Hey, if, if a, if a pandemic happens, here's how you solve no. it. But really kind of looking at that big picture yeah. and, you know, being thoughtful of how we how we move forward. So I really appreciate getting to know you, learn more oh. about you. Um, say hi to the people in Visalia for me. I, I had a wonderful time awesome. uh, out there and I know we have some uh, common connections. So I, I really appreciate your time, but everyone listening, check out Donia's book. Donia, thank you so much for being on the podcast and all the best as your daughter leaves your home. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank have you, George. Thank have you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks for listening. All right. Bye-bye.